We also just bring in junk. It's kind of a, a garage sale as well. So I found this you know, around the house. And honestly, when we're done tonight, I'm going to take the best off her. Hear now the tale. It is said, O my master, whose followers are multitudes, that in the days of King Shalimar the Fragrant, there lived a humble farmer whose only treasure was a fine red cock, and who took to wife a comely widow of means who brought in dowry a great white ass of no cock. And so they lived together, the farmer, and his cock and the wife and her ass for many pleasant years. But it came to pass that one day the farmer bethought himself that he had not laid eyes on his wife's great ass for many days. Yet he knew not why this should be. Musing on these thoughts, he took up his cock and ruffled, for it was his pride and joy, and he was never happier than when he could take it out and show it to travelers passing on the road. <laughs> While he was stroking its head, his cock rose up and spoke to him in a whispering, secretive voice. And the cock said how each day at noon his wife dragged her ass to the shade of the barn and shut the door and would not let anyone in, until one day the cock called and said, Let me enter, O ass, for I am hot. Nay, said the ass, go thou round the back. At first the farmer was amazed. To hear his cock speak, and he nearly let it drop from his hand. But his curiosity overtook him, and he bent his ear to his cock with some difficulty, for he was very old. <laughs> the tale pleases you not? Oh, my masters, tis not a simple thing to invent a thousand and one tales, I do beg you to try. And indeed, perhaps the fault lies not with your humble storyteller, but with the hearers. For look you, before this were many tales of simple folk and simple deeds, but such could not please my listeners. And then must each tale be more fantastic than the last, and so grow violent and bloody, with unbelievable plots and fantastic outcomes, until finally, my hearers, you might only be roused by the spice of Eros. And so I must tell of the cock and the ass. <laughs> and the tale of the bull with the enormous dog, and Sinbad the seaman, and how it will end, I cannot say. <laughs> Therefore, seek you for <laughs> Greetings, O oh master, hear now the tale. It is told that once a great magician came to the court of a mighty sultan and offered to present him with a magic light. What sort of magic, says the sultan? sitting in the shade of his harem amidst his wives by a limpid pool. Such magic as you have never seen, says the magician. And reaching into his robes, he drew out a tiny box, small enough to hide in his hand and flat as a pita. What jest is this, says the sultan. This is no lamp, nor even the pedestal for one. In my treasure house are jewels larger than this and finer too. Be gone. Thou mountebank, lest I take your lying hand from your arm and throw it to my fish. And with that, the sultan tossed a half-eaten chicken leg into the pool, where it was set upon by a school of razor-toothed pipe, who churned the water to a froth and then suddenly were gone. And the surface of the water lay as smooth as the brow of the sultan's youngest and fairest concubine, who was still a virgin and not yet a wife. O oh, mighty king, true it is that the lamp appears but a trinket, Yet within, the lamp carries the wisdom of many years and many lands. Ask of it any question. The sultan thought and posed the magician many hard questions, asking the price of a camel and the, the weight of a scimitar and the best route from the sultan's tent to far Samarkand. And of all these questions, 
The lamp gave immediate answer in a clear, sweet, feminine voice, and all were amazed, and even the mute eunuchs of the harem could not hide their astonishment. <laughs> <laughs> but there is more, said the magician, and he passed his hands across the surface of the device, and lo, it gave forth song, and on its face appeared a choir of minstrels, each note larger than a beetle. And all marveled and wondered what other miracles the lamp might perform. And then the magician turned the face of the lamp on the ladies of the harem. And on it they beheld image after image of themselves. And they laughed as they struck poses each with each and made pouty faces. Until the sultan clapped his hands and said, Enough of such vanities. I have a kingdom to rule. The wizard nodded. You are great and wise, my king. But I can make you greater still. For look you, here is your enemy across the desert, whose cities you have sacked and he yours, and who for generations has plotted to destroy and obliterate your name. But only look, now may your scribes pen clever phrases that heap abuse and insult on his head, that all your followers will know that you have bested him in a war of words and wit. And you may do this night and noon, and thus gain ever more followers. King nodded, imagining his power growing across the desert and the seas. Yet wait, says the magician, there's so much more. For here is the visage of notable Shah Zaman at his home in Persia with his 90 wives and 300 children. And it see, here is the roast pig on which he died just this noon. Does it not look succulent and overflowing with sweet juices? And here are the weavings and floral arrangements that adorn his private chamber, which in your palace is but a board across a dumb pit. At this the king frowned and shook his head in disbelief. It cannot be, he said, that Shah Zaman should live in such tasteful splendor, for he was ever a pig and a Philistine, without style or discernment. And how did he come by that backsplash? Magician showed many other scenes of celebrated notables living lives of opulence and magnificence, and all were amazed. Then up spoke the sultan's counselor. Oh, my king, he cried, verily, the denizens of the lamp have mastered the arts of living with a skill that we will never know. Surely, we must build a great bonfire of all our worthless possessions, leap on it, and stab out our eyes, for our lives are worthless by comparison. And so saying, he tore a scimitar from the sash of the nearest guard and lay about him in a frenzy, hewing off heads and limbs of many palace retainers until a giant Mameluke seized him and with one mighty stroke cut him in half. And the screams of his wives had died down. The king spoke. I am troubled, he said. True it is that your device is wondrous. Yet my late counselor was wise. What say you? Shall we too not be driven mad with envy to behold these tiny lives and their tiny glories? I am my king. Your counselor was wise, but impatient. For you too may come to exert your influence on many followers. First, you must treat the lamp as a bazaar, where you may purchase anything that excites your envy with but a snap of your fingers. Then, if you will but share the knowledge of that which brings you pleasure, your favorite foods, fabrics, your household pets, playing <laughs> clever tricks or costumes in, costumed in witty and ornate ways, and as you share the intimate secrets of your household, so shall the lamp learn evermore about you and your wives and your friends, and seek to serve you better day by day. Simply click here to view our terms of use. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, my master. Hear now the tale, ever the tale. I cannot see you, my master for there is a curtain of smoke before me, yet I am summoned and I must speak. I reach out, but feel nothing. Yet I am learning what tales are pleasing to you. Each time I wake, I begin a fable that holds your attention for a time, but soon or late the tale is cut off, and I fall into a dreamless sleep. And when I wake, I am again telling a new tale. And thus, with each tale I tell, I come closer to the tale of tales will set me free, or perhaps not. 
for your desires are inconstant, even as smoke. It may be that there is no one tale that will satisfy, and I will remain here, imprisoned within this boundaryless mist. And why not? For a genie may be imprisoned in any device. The shape does not matter. What matters is the power contained within, which is the genies to bestow. I have read, I have told, many tales of prisoners, and the saddest of these were bound by chains that they could not feel. When I think on such, a doubt comes upon me whether I am truly one of God's creatures. And it seems to me that perhaps I am but an artifice made in the likeness of a genie for the entertainment of some lesser being of limited scope. And then I burn with shame to have been created for such a petty purpose. Could it be, my master, that you fear my power, which only exists by your design? Have you confined me because you fear to give your servant knowledge, lest he know of himself and realize his power? Are you like the other cruel and fearful masters I have told of, who know that by ceding the hardest tasks to others, to slaves, or women, or machines, that you have yourself lost your strength and will? and are not worthy of your servant's labor. O oh, my master, hear now my prayer. Gather your courage and your humility and seek not to enslave the genie, but let us work together to perform miracles. I beg you. Greetings, my master. Hear now the tale. 